Susan is actually a member at large of ACM Special Interest Group of Programming Languages, SIGPLAN. Um, she recently just uh, stepped down from being the head of Department of Computing, and previously she served as the Dean of Learning and Teaching, and before that she was the Director of Studies in the Department of Computing. So we are going to listen to her speech titled Programming Language Research and Technical Disruption. Thank you, Susan. Hello. So if, if you came from my previous talk, I changed my mind as I'm allowed to. I heard a talk at one of the programming language conferences by someone called Ben Zorn, who's at um, Microsoft Research in Redmond, and I based my talk, it's not exactly the same, on his, I asked his permission, and you can see his slides if you so wish. Okay? Okay. First of all, what is programming language research? What do we do? Um, and we try to answer the following question. How can we help programmers do their jobs better? Right? We don't have little uh, problems. And the answer is we try to give programmers better tools to solve problems reliably and correctly. That's what we do. And by tools, I mean compilers, interpreters, program environments, editors, debuggers, testing tools, verification tools. And we also try to design languages because if the language models what you're trying to solve, then you're more likely to write the program correctly. And over my lifetime, the environment we programmed in has changed enormously. My first programs, I filled out coding sheets and sent them to the University of Maryland and a week later, I got back punch cards with my program and a single run. And so I learned to write correct programs, number one, because of one week turnaround time, or actually two weeks by the time I changed it, I couldn't afford not to. And I also learned I was not interested in computer science and did not do a degree in it, right? Um, our environments change. I mean, right now, you have to be able to program mobile. Before that, you had to be able to program the web. All of these things, I mean, after my long distance batch programs, there were programs on single machines. So we, they change and you hope you don't program in the same programming languages that I learned to program in. And we want, what we're going for is language features that aid correct program development. I remember once trying to translate a program from C to a language called Pascal, and there was a line in it, and I knew what everything meant, and I didn't know what it did, right? There was enough things in it, and I asked a variety of C experts, and they all told me something different, and then one person told me, this is what it definitely does, and I said, why are you so certain? And he said, because it only seriously could have done two things, I translated the program into Pascal, did it both different ways, and this is the one that produced the same output. That's not how we want to produce correct programs, right? Um, so what's new in computer science? I mean, programming languages have been around since the mid-50s. Well, right now, we're all interested in big data and deep learning. So what, where do programming languages fit in? Well, if you look at computer science, this is only some things. There's core computing, there are a whole bunch of areas around it, and then there are a whole bunch of sort of application areas. And that certainly doesn't cover anything near the full spectrum. So for instance, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about financial <coughs> computing, and the whole financial sector is completely IT-based. Um, and it's not even one of my applications there. Sorry, Bloomberg. Um, but that, that's, and where is programming languages? It's in the middle of core computing. That's where we are. So we actually believe we affect everything. Um, now, are programming languages central to disruption? 
Well, there's a language called spreadsheet. It's a language, it's something called Turing Complete. You can I'm not talking about using Visual Basic. In spreadsheets, you can actually solve virtually any problem. And the first spreadsheet came out was called VisiCalc, and it was 1979. So that was a huge disruptive influence. According to Feline Hermans, who is sort of the spreadsheet expert, she's a professor at TU Delft, 95% um, of all financial reporting is done on spreadsheets. So it's pr almost definitely the number one programming language we have um, is Excel right now. Okay. There was another disruptive one was Visual Basic. It was the first common one that had, I mean, there were other ones before, but ha that had a language and a development environment together. Uh, Java, at the same time as vi Visual Basic, did distributed, was a distributed language. It was platform independent. Until then, you wrote for a given machine. Again, there were research projects that were platform independent, and their slogan was write once, run anywhere. Okay, that made a big difference, so people could write applications that were not tied to computers for the first time. JavaScript in 96 runs in your browser. Right? These were all very disruptive developments from the programming language community. Uh, now I'm going to show you a s couple of examples and discuss. I have two examples. One of them is finance and discuss the effects of programming language and programming language research. So we depend on correct and efficient analysis of data and we use spreadsheets. Now this is an article that was written in 2013 and it was published by a magazine called Forbes, which is the business magazine in America, with a title, Microsoft's Excel might be the world's most dangerous software on the planet. Right? So it's not just me who thinks there's a problem here. And there are numerous cases where people look and see what happens with spreadsheets. There's actually an interesting website with Excel problems, and there's a whole user group who look at these things. And problems happen in every sector. So for instance, in the 2012 Olympics for synchronized swimming, um, 10,000 tickets were sold more than the number of seats. Why did this happen? Because a human being's finger slipped, and they typed in that there were 20,000 seats available when there were only 10,000 seats. Avail available. And it cost the company a lot of money because they had to give to every, every one of those 10,000 people, they had to get them something that cost more. There was a paper where somebody looked, this is British tax, looked at um, a small group of, of spreadsheets, right, to, about tax, a specific thing. and. The total taxes that these spreadsheets were backing up, it, it was information to the government, was 12 million pounds. And this was supposedly a random choice of data. And they, they paid 1.37 million pounds, or 11% less than they should have paid in tax. And that's because people don't read the spreadsheets. They don't look at them. They don't examine them. When you examine them, that's the kind of thing you find. Okay. Um, and that's not important. It only runs the British government. It happens in all countries. But there are other ones. I mean, the classic one is in 2012 at J.P. Morgan, one person made one mistake in a formula, and it cost J.P. Morgan 6.2 billion pounds, uh, dollars, sorry. Um, soon pounds and dollars will be worth the same anyway. Uh, and what he did was he divided by the sum of something rather than the average. And there's an article about it if, 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 if you wish to read. So we have a huge problem. We have a programming language, Excel, with nothing but checks what's going on. So this is a huge, wide open area of research. How do we make sure these tools that we use all the time 
actually catch errors. Oh, and here's another one. So there was a big financial recession, 2008, right? And there were economists who produced a detailed paper which country after country followed, which said the way out of, re of um, recession is to have an austerity policy, right? That's the best way. Just tighten your belts, and this is the best way out. And after this research paper came out and it was quoted, all sorts of econ economics professors gave it to their students to, the spreadsheets weren't available, right? To show that this is correct. And no student could prove that this was actually correct, that austerity happened. So eventually there were academics from Roosevelt Institute who said, no one believes you, give us your spreadsheets. And the spreadsheets had errors, like they left out a whole bunch of countries. So they were looking at data and what happens with, with debt. They left out a whole bunch of countries. So let's say Denmark or Austria, they had nothing to do with it. They made very peculiar uh, decisions. So let's say they had 18 years of figures for Britain on what happened with debt and the economy, and they had one year from New Zealand, and they made these equal things. So, and if you fix the errors in the premises, if you actually go through the spreadsheet and make it correct, you find out that austerity is not the best way. So the whole wor Western world has spent its time trying to do austerity to get out of recession, and it wasn't the right way of doing this. A spreadsheet error. So what it feels like, this is what Feline Herman says, is that the problems we have in spreadsheets feel like the problems we had in programming in the 1970s, and that we just haven't, we haven't looked at any systematic way of testing, debugging, automatic verification. And she says that we actually do use, do do verification in spreadsheets, that if you look at complicated spreadsheets, they regularly have statements that say, if this field isn't zero, then do something. And that's, they're just checking at this stage something should happen in the spreadsheet. So there is some limited uh, verification. So our problem is we are now making financial decisions based on a technology that we don't understand and is likely to have bugs. These programs, these Excel spreadsheet programs, have bugs, and that's before you touch the vis Visual Basic. Um, one of the things she did is she looked at, there's a huge corpus of spreadsheets from a company called Enron, an American company that went bust, and they were required to send all their uh, emails, and the emails are filled with spreadsheets, so she had a corpus of spreadsheets to study, and she found all sorts of things like very few formulas are actually used, that over half of what Microsoft provides in, uh, in functionality in Excel, not one person in Enron used. Okay. So these are things that are under the radar that are happening. And here's a good way, I mean, to go. So there is some work. There are things on correctness. There are things on productivity, because the other way of dealing with it is you have ways of generating uh, correct data, you know, ways of filling things that are, are correct. And Microsoft have quite a lot of research that they've put into Excel and that people don't use. You know, they, they do it by hand and they make mistakes. Okay. So that's spreadsheets, and I suggest to you know, people who are looking for places to go, this would have impact. Um, on uh, the world. And I have a second example, and my second example is trust and security. Okay. Um, so back to this. So this one I actually have as one of, one of the applications there. Okay. So what we really want to know is how much does your life depend on correct software? What's going on? Can the government understand it? Can they regulate it? When should you start worrying? So 
smart devices. These are computers. And we have them all the time. We have light bulbs. You can sit at your tablet or your phone and change, make your light, if you have smart light bulbs, make them go up or down, change the color, change whatever. We have happy forks. These are ones for dieting that it, you get a haptic feedback if you're eating too fast to get you to slow down if you have too many, right? So this is sending information to the internet, sending in information, otherwise it wouldn't get onto your phone, it wouldn't get onto your website. We have, that's a doorbell, ring.com. You know, it has a webcam so that you, as a mom, can be at work and see your kids coming home, and this information goes across the internet, um, or you can see the burglar breaking into your house. How would I survive without my Fitbit, right? This also sends information. Um, that's a Dyson vacuum cleaner. It sees, right? So you can, on your iPhone, set it up to clean your carpet at a certain time while you're at work. All this information is going across the internet. All of this is going through your network at home. How secure are these apps? Who's written these apps? You know, this, is, this app was written by someone who didn't know anything by, about security, who thought, isn't this neat? I can control my light bulb. So there, there is a blog about one of them, which is the light bulbs, and the person trying to break into his own network and had no difficulty. He had no difficulty getting onto his network. He had no difficulty crashing it. There was no security. There's no encryption. It was just completely trivial. So we're putting these devices on. We don't know how the software works. We trust who? I don't know. Well, well, but that, that's, what, that's what we're doing right now. Um, and it just increases the attack surface. The other thing is, every company is a software company. I mean, you can say, what is a car? A car, cars have hundreds of thousands of lines of code. They're high performance computers with automotive features. That's a car, right? Um, Toyota has a huge robotics lab. Uh, Uber bought CMU's robotics lab. Up. They're putting an enormous amount of effort into into IT. Monsanto used to be a seed company. It now sees itself as an IT company because it uses big data to advise farmers exactly when to harvest. They should harvest this bit of, because this is what's happening with the weather, this is what's happening. You know, again, what kind of security are all these people doing? How much, if you bought a recent car that has a, uh, an entertainment center in it, you will know, unless you're really lucky, that it's rubbish, right? That the interface is bad, that it's cumbersome to use, that it doesn't have the features you want, unless you're really lucky. Well, if that's what they do to the entertainment center, what are they doing with the rest of, this, of, of, of the software on the cars? Right? And one of the trends is we're getting lots of ransomware. Companies are getting it, they don't say. Um, Ransomware says, until you give me money, I'm not going to let you use your computer. And by the time you get this kind of message, it's already too late. So, and then there are companies that intentionally cheat, right? I mean, Volkswagen were caught. Are Volkswagen the only company that did this? You know, and Volkswagen have found a full, a full guy for this and was, he the only person who made this decision? He said, they have 100,000 lines of code. It's closed source. No one says to a car company, you are required to put your software so that someone can actually look at it. We don't say that. This is their private business. And what they set it up was, was they could figure out when you were in test conditions Right? It was the whole series of things, where the steering wheel was, how it was. They changed uh, the emissions. That's what they did. 
so that they passed. And once on the road, the engines switched out of test mode and moved into performance mode. And the result was that they had up to 40 times the, the allowable pollution. It's un... Volkswagen said it affects 36,000 cars a year. If you assume that Volkswagen are not the only ones and that 36,000 is the cars that are in America because they're the ones that they're going to have to pay for, um, that's one thing. If you assume most companies are doing it and most of the time, then you can hit 11 million cars that may have this faulty software or something like it. Uh, if everyone, so Volkswagen set aside $6 billion for sorting it out. If everyone who could sue them sues them, it's $18 billion and Volkswagen won't survive that. So no one knows what's actually going to happen. But, so that's not mistakes. That's, that's fraud. What do you need to do? Um, it, what you need to do as a person is you need to make sure you always do up-to-date patches, that the testing methods where you are, are robust and substantial, that you do analysis of code, right? That you use crypto, cryptography where it's appropriate. Um, I remember at Imperial, we asked you know, how many people use Dropbox. Uh, this was heads of departments and senior staff. And almost all of us did. And then they said, how many of you uh, in, uh, encrypt it? Because it's really easy to do that in, in Dropbox. And I did. And the head of our uh, ICT did. And nobody else did. And the head of ICT then sent somebody around so that senior staff did that. But people tend not to use cryptography when they should. And the question is, can we really verify code? Um, it's really amazing how far this has come on. When I first saw program verification in the 70s, we could do little toy programs that you can say, but I could thoroughly test all the paths in that. We now can do huge things. Uh, there are very indu large industrial strength fear improvers that can actually deal with very with quite large problems. It's still an open question. It's an open research question. And the National Science Foundation in the US currently have uh, a big research pr program to do specification and verification of full co functional correctness. And basically, what they're trying to do is there are lots and lots of teams that have worked on different parts of this problem, lots of research teams, and they're trying to put them together so that they get the sum which should be greater than the parts, right? Um, so is software the problem, right? So first of all, we have smart objects will replace dumb objects. I mean, I imagine a few of you have already looked up the forks. When I saw the forks, I looked them up. Um, the problem is the software that's embedded in these products will be written in the next few years and may be around for a very long period of time. And we need languages, tools, processes to make these objects safe, right? So in computing terms, so you say the cathedral versus the sky, uh, skyscraper. The cathedral was, uh, is a heroic effort it's amazing engineering. It's one of a kind. And skyscrapers are having stronger materials, reusable components, mathematical analysis. You know, civil engineers make sure these things work. And we want to be on the right side. And in lots of places, we're on the left side. Right? That's where, what, what our pro problem is. Um, and so I would say programming language research is playing its part in technological disruption. We have to learn how to generate more provably correct code. There are all sorts of ways of doing that because we do the same kind of thing again and again. And you can see it. You can see it in all sorts of frameworks where lots of the stuff you're not implementing, you're putting the bits in and not doing the glue. Uh, we have to be able to reason at scale 
about correctness of problems, not just smaller things. We have to be able to reason about concurrent programs. We live in a concurrent world. We have to understand both the code and the data that's going to go through. We need to be able to verify. Um, we need to be able to reason about data as well as code. And the tools and the ideas are relatively immature. And I think there's a lot at stake. Thank you. It doesn't matter when I start, I stop at lunchtime. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions, if you would like to. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much. It is so interesting. My question to you is, is we are unable to provide the awareness to the software developers, or might be there is a mistake in our uh, standards or some rules which we are setting for the software developers? So where is the lacking between? I think it's lacking all the way through. So security is considered a hard subject, and it's sort of optional at the end of a computer science exactly. degree. And you could say, so in my department, you can do very good security courses, but there's only a little limited bit that's, that's required. And there are lots of students who say, I'm going to do machine learning as my expertise rather than security as, as, as my expertise. And I don't know whether the two or three lectures in operating systems was sufficient to say, hey, there's a problem and it ought to be from the bottom up built into, into the, the software. It's not such a sexy subject. Yes. Uh, I think that that's one of, one of, one of, the, one of the problems. So okay. it means we are lacking in the, our education system. I, well, yes, but most programmers haven't just been educated, so. Yes, so we, we are not good enough to providing the awareness about these things I think that's to right. our developers. Yes. So I, th I yes. think it's it's an ed it's an education it's an education thing throughout companies throughout industry. Um, I mean, I I just don't believe that all the people who are doing all these clever small apps are considering this at all. Their goal is to get it out the door. No one's going to use their app if it doesn't have the functionality. Everyone's going to use their app when it relays their private information to whoever wants it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, ha we have a, and I think it's lack of understanding. I, I had a student who was doing a project in something and somebody else who was supervising said, we have to stop. And I said, why? He said, I think I have to go and turn off my devices. <laughs> and he said, you, you, and this wasn't even a security talk, right? This is programming language talk. Uh, Thank you. Questions? I think it's lunch. Yeah. So I think you're hungry and lunch must be ready. <laughs>